they've done studies with learning and trying to find out what's the best way to, way to, to learn information. And they say audio, audio visual is one of the best ways you know, to see things and hear it. So if any of you, um, you know, um, could potentially post lectures online with a video recording, that would be fantastic. And if I can help in any way, even though I'm just like a techno dinosaur, but just let me know. Maybe we can get some IT help. Great. Okay, so what we're going to do, folks, is maybe, not guaranteed, but maybe we'll almost finish chapter eight today. Um, so you were there last time we were introducing this incredible concept of horizontal or lateral gene transfer in prokaryotes. And we're going to discover there's three different ways that bacteria can share genetic information with their neighbors. And um, this is really pretty amazing stuff. Even though we say that bacteria reproduce asexually, uh, meaning that they make copies of their genetic information and why they do, bacteria have an incredible ability to share genetic information with their neighbors. And so, in fact, some microbial geneticists have even gone so far to say that bacteria are promiscuous. They love sharing their genetic information. So we want to see how this happens. And we want to make sure that we're always asking ourselves, well, why is this significant? Why is this important? So in the background, we always want to be considering the, the challenges that you know, modern medicine faces with the spread of antibiotic resistance genes, um, the transfer of toxin genes between bacteria, um, the transfer of other virulence factors, such as um, the ability to produce um, capsules. So this, these horizontal gene transfers, unfortunately, assures that we will continue to see the spread of antibiotic resistance. And we'll also see that with horizontal gene transfer, no doubt we're going to see the emergence of brand new bacterial pathogens in the future. Okay, so this is a pretty important topic. So it turns out there are three different ways that bacteria can transfer genes horizontally or laterally. And the first one is called transformation, which is the uptake of naked DNA from the environment by competent bacteria. The second one we'll discuss is called conjugation. This is the closest thing that literally looks like bacterial sex to us. This is the transfer of genetic information from a donor bacterium to a recipient that involves actual cell-to-cell -cell contact. And then the third uh, way that bacteria can transfer genes horizontally is with the help of bacterial viruses, bacteriophage, um, in the process called transduction, bacterial viruses transfer DNA from a donor bacterium to a recipient bacterium. Okay, so the three horizontal um, um, gene transfer methods then are transformation, conjugation, and transduction. So we'll first take a look at the history of um, transformation, the uptake of naked DNA by competent bacteria. And we want to explore the history because this is the, the history of the discovery of transformation still um, is important for us today. And so we're going to go back to the 1920s um, to the work of a microbiologist by the name of Frederick Griffith. Now the 1920s, of course, followed World War I, which was 1914 to 1918, a horrific World War. Right at the end of World War I, 1918, and then into the first year of peace, 1919, there was an absolutely horrific influenza pandemic. Pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. So many people died. Nobody knows for sure how many people died. The estimates are between 25 million and 40 million people worldwide, possibly more. People died, and there's no record of it. So back um, back in the early 1900s, no one knew what caused influenza. We now know it's a virus, right? No one knew what caused influenza, um, but. Even back in the early 1900s, people were aware that um, sometimes influenza would kill a person, but often what would end up killing the person is that they would first suffer from influenza. And we now know that influenza virus destroys some of our um, primary defenses against respiratory pathogens. Following the influenza infection, when the normal defenses of the upper respiratory tract have been compromised, those people would be very, very um, susceptible to bacterial pneumonia, a secondary uh, pathogen. So um, folks were aware of the bacterial pathogens that could cause pneumonia. So Frederick Griffith 
was attempting to develop a vaccine against one of these bacterial pathogens called Streptococcus pneumonia. So the bacterium that Griffith The bacteria then that Frederick Griffith was working with um, were two strains, excuse me, of the bacterial pathogen Streptococcus pneumonia. And again, Streptococcus pneumonia was a common cause of secondary bacterial pneumonia following um, influenza. So Griffith hoped to make a vaccine that could protect people against pneumonia caused by Streptococcus pneumonia. And um, what, um, in part of his experimental model, he had two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia. One was called the S strain, and S stands for smooth colony type. And the S strain, um, I'll just show that our, um, our streptococcus, um, streptococcus pneumonia, when it divides, it often, um, uh, two cells won't separate, so we often see them as diplococci. So those would be our two um, streptococcus pneumonia cells. And then the S strain, the reason it formed a nice smooth colony was that the S strain forms a nice thick capsule made out of polysaccharides. And do you all remember from our discussion of bacterial cell structures, for bacteria that invade animals, humans, or other animals, what is one of the most important functions of that capsule? It's antiphagocytic, right? It inhibits phagocytosis by most phagocytic cells. And the two that we most commonly discuss are neutrophils and macrophages. Okay, so this means that encapsulated bacterial pathogens, when they invade us or invade another human, they have a huge survival advantage. Our phagocytic cells cannot attach to them and thus can't ingest them and kill them. So, um, so it turns out that this F strain, when Griffith injected the S strain streptomonia into mice, so he, he used mice as an experimental model. When he injected the S strain into mice, the mice would die. And this is just a cartoon of that. This is figure 8.24 out of your textbook. So this is a little cartoon of the encapsulated streptococcus pneumonia. Here are the two cells, and the, the orange brown color represents the capsules. When the living S strain was injected into mice, the mice died. And when Griffith did the meat proxy on the mice and took samples from the dead mice and spread the samples over the surface of auger plates and incubated them, he got these nice, lovely, smooth, shiny um, S strain columns. Now, Griffith also had a second strain of Streptococcus pneumonia called the R strain. And R stands for rough colony type. And the reason the R strain formed these rough colonies was, was that they lacked a capsule. Okay, the, the genes that encoded the enzymes for capsule for, uh, um, uh, capsule synthesis, oh, this is going to be a long lecture, you guys, <laughs> were there's mutations, so they couldn't make the, the enzymes for capsule synthesis. So they didn't have a nice smooth colony when they were produced. Now, for the mice, this was great, because since the R strain lacked a capsule, when the living R strain was injected into mice, the mouse phagocytic cells could easily attach to them, ingest them, and kill them. So um, if we talk about the ability of these two strains to cause disease, the S strain would be called a pathogenic or highly virulent. Pathogenic is the ability to cause disease, and then we use the term virulence to, to describe how serious the disease is. And if a microbe can easily call, kill an animal, we say it's highly virulent. The R strain, in contrast, since it was easily killed by the protective white blood cells of the mice, this, was, it, this would be called non-pathogenic. It can't cause disease or 
um, we could say a virulent. Okay, the, the mice would live. And we see that in this cartoon, the second cartoon. This is a cartoon of the R strain streptococcus pneumonia. We see the two diplococci, but they lack a capsule. So when they are injected into the mice, the mice live because their phagocytic cells could destroy the unencapsulated um, streptococcus pneumonia. Now, the next experiment that Griffith performed was he took the virulent S strain and he used heat to kill them. This is a real common way that low, kind of low-tech vaccines are made. You take the pathogen, you heat them to destroy them so they, are, they can no longer replicate, but very often they can still trigger a protective immune response. So this is a really common way to make a vaccine. So Griffith took the, um, the S strain, he killed it with heat, and injected the dead S strain into the mice, and as you, we might predict, the mice lived, right? And he didn't recover any any uh, streptococcus pneumonia from those living mice because they were all dead. That makes sense. We're like, okay, that's a no-brainer. But it was the next experiment that he performed that was just wild. What he did was he mixed living R strain streptomonia and killed S strain streptomonia. So here's a mixture right here. Injected those into a mice. And he would have predicted that the mice should have lived, right? Because the living R strain wouldn't kill the mice. The dead S strain wouldn't kill the mice. So he thought what he, we mixed them together and injected the mice, he thought they should live. But the surprising result was what? The mice died. The mice died. He's like, what the heck is going on here? So when he did the necropsy, he took samples and plated them. He was even more perplexed because what grew? Colonies that looked exactly like the living S strain. They had this nice thick capsule. So Griffith's like, what the heck is going on here? So he came up with a lovely model. He came up with a lovely model. And we'll try to cartoon the model here. What Griffith proposed was that the killed, okay, so we're going to call these the killed S strain, had released genetic information encoding for capsule production. And that genetic information, okay, and we'll just show these guys lysing because that's what happened when bacteria die, they lyse. That genetic information, and I'm just going to put it as a squiggle here, you guys, because back in the 1920s, nobody knew for sure what the genetic information of cells was. Okay, so we'll just call this the, so the generic genetic information. Nobody knew what it was. The genetic information was taken up by the living R cells. And by taking up that genetic information, it changed or transformed the R cells into capsule-producing bacteria. Okay. So this genetic information is taken up, and that genetic information, we'll just show it as these squiggles in here, because remember, nobody knew what it was. The genetic information changed or transformed the R cells into encapsulated, meaning they make a capsule, encapsulated R cells, which would look like this. Okay. And encapsulated R cells look exactly like what? It just looked like an S, a living S strain, right? So that is what killed the mice. That is what Griffith recovered from the mice were these transformed or changed R cells. They've taken up the genetic information from the dead S cells that permitted them to make a capsule. And you know now we can't tell them from a living um, S strain. So this was a hot debate, you guys, way back then. Um, scientists were at war with one another over what was the identity of the genetic information. So Griffith was really smart. Instead of inflaming either of the camps, he just called the genetic information the transforming factor transforming agent. He was really smart. He didn't want to make anybody mad, so he, he just called this genetic information the transforming, the changing factor. But this model permitted other scientists to carry out new experiments to try to identify what was the chemical nature of this transforming factor. And so in the 1940s, scientists um, re-ran this experiment multiple times. And what they would do is when they would mix the 
the dead S cells and living R cells together, they would add different enzymes that would destroy different organic molecules. So in one batch, they would add proteases, which would destroy proteins. In another batch, they would add lipases that would destroy lipids. In another batch, they would add enzymes that could destroy sugars or carbohydrates. And in one batch, they added DNAs. Now, the way these experiments were worked up, they would take each batch of, um, of um, this mixture treated with a different enzyme, and then they inoculate the mice, and they would see, okay, um, will this mixture kill the mice or not? And all the mixtures that had, you know, proteases, lipases, enzymes to destroy sugars, the mixture still ended up um, killing the mice. They would still recover the transformed R, living R cells. The only mix that um, didn't work was the mix that they added the DNAs to. And the, the, the reasoning here was the DNAs was destroying the transforming factor. It was destroying the genetic information that was released by the living R cells. And thus, that experiment helped to prove the genetic information in the cells was what? This DNA. And that was a big deal, you guys. Nowadays, I know you guys in kindergarten you probably learned that the DNA, the, the DNA is the genetic information of cells. So we're kind of like, what was a big deal? But back then, that was huge. The scientists, there was the protein camp. A lot of the scientists thought proteins have to be the genetic information of cells because it's so diverse, right? And then there were those crazy scientists that thought DNA was the genetic information of cells. And the protein folks thought they, the DNA folks were crazy. How could DNA, with only you know four, uh, four nucleotides, four bases, how could that encode all the complexity of living organisms? Yeah, but it turned out the crazy DNA people were right, right? So, um, so this experiment, it, it, it was important in um, showing that bacteria could exchange genetic information horizontally. And also, it was an important um, experiment in the search for the identity of genetic information of cells. Now, the question is, what the heck was going on there? I mean, we just kind of said, you know, this magically happened. I drew an arrow here. So what the heck is going on right here? So we want to explore this. So what we, we want to explore is this phenomenon that we're going to describe as natural transformation. And a natural transformation, um, we have a phenomenon where some bacteria can naturally become competent. Okay, so we'll just put to some bacteria in nature.
So we know when the, um, the S strain dies, it breaks open and lyses, and the chromosome ends up being broken into little fragments, and the chromosomal DNA is released. Okay. So that those little pieces of chromosomal DNA from the, from the dead S cells, the DNA binding proteins on the R strain can bind to them, and what's cool is they can actually help the DNA pass into um, the, the, this would be our recipient now. So with those DNA binding proteins, little pieces of the dead S cells, and this would be then our donor. Our donor is gonna be the dead S cell, and the R strain is gonna be our recipient. Little pieces of the donor uh, chromosomal DNA are introduced into the cytoplasm, and remember, these are both streptococcus pneumonia. There's going to be some similar DNA sequences on both the chromosomes. So we can get a replacement of part of the R strain's chromosome with a little fragment, homologous fragment of chromosome from the S strain. You guys remember this cartoon. So um, through homologous recombination, oops, we get the S strain. DNA replacing part of the R strain DNA, okay, and that little piece of our um, R strain DNA will be degraded. And the thought is, is that one of these R strains was to su successfully transform with the piece of DNA from the S strain that carried the genes for capsule production. And that's what permitted the transformed R strain to now synthesize the capsule. So this was our transformed R strain. So it turns out in nature, for a bacterium to become naturally competent, they must have the genes for these DNA binding proteins. And what microbiologists have discovered is usually the genes for these DNA binding proteins are usually expressed only in a certain uh, phase of the bacterial growth curve. And very often, for example, it's during log phase or exponential phase. So the phase of growth is also important. Now it turns out that there are a limited number of bacteria in nature that have these DNA binding proteins. And um, just to give you an idea of some of the bacteria that can become naturally competent and thus can be naturally transformed in nature, as, as we just discussed, the genus, members of the genus Streptococcus can be naturally competent. The genus Haemophilus, such as Haemophilus influenza type B, which can cause neonatal meningitis and septicemia. The genus Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea, which causes the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitis, which causes bacterial um, uh, meningitis. The genus Bacillus, so for example, our good friend Bacillus anthracis can become uh, naturally competent. Unfortunately, the genus Staphylococcus, so Staphylococcus aureus, can be naturally transformed. And a very significant opportunistic pathogen, huge problem in hospitals, the genus Pseudomonas. Okay, so these are examples of um, bacterial pathogens that have the DNA binding proteins, they can become naturally confident, they can take up naked DNA from their environment. And again, the naked DNA could encode information for virulence factors on capsules, it could be information for antibiotic resistance genes, it could be information for toxins, right? So for a human perspective, we're like, this is not good, this is not good at all, when these pathogens can become naturally transformed. Now, one thing you'll note up there is our good friend, our workhorse of microbial genetics, E. coli, is not present. And boy, was that a bummer for microbial geneticists. You know, they, they have the greatest amount of information on E. coli. And consequently, when initial experiments were being done with genetic engineering, moving genes from one organism into another, the first candidate was, of course, E. coli. They knew the most about E. coli. But E. coli never evolved these DNA binding proteins, so it doesn't become naturally competent. You can't naturally uh, uh, transform it. So what these really smart scientists, how they figured this out, I don't know. They figured out a way to make E. coli artificially competent. So let's take a look at that. This is actually an experiment. Um, we'll do a demo on this particular experiment in lab. So you're gonna, you're gonna see this experiment performed. So we can next 
and talk about artificial transformation. And that is, can we take bacteria that lack DNA binding protein genes and can we somehow transform them in the lab under artificial conditions? And the answer is yes. And it's amazingly simple. It just blows me away how simple this is. So we'll use our good friend E. coli, which again, lacks DNA binding protein, so it's not naturally transformable. And what the scientists figured out is if you treat the E. Um, e. coli with 50 millimolar calcium chloride and cold temperatures, so you incubate them on ice in this, in this 50 millimolar calcium chloride, that will make the E. coli artificially complement. And we don't mean that they're expressing DNA binding, DNA binding proteins. What we mean is we can drive naked DNA into these treated E. coli. Now, what this treatment does, I think is still a little bit unclear. I've read descriptions where people say, well, the cold temporarily stabilizes transient pores in the outer membrane and cytoplasmic membrane. I'm like, wow, that, for me, that's a stretch. Okay, but I think it represents that we don't exactly know the mechanism by which this treatment with the cold calcium chloride works. Um, one thing that does make sense to me is the calcium chloride, um, it will ionize in suspension, and you'll get the um, possibly charged calcium ions. And the idea here is that possibly charged calcium ions will bind to the naked DNA that you're trying to transform your E. coli with. And remember, DNA is so chock full of those phosphate groups, it has a net negative charge, and that would make it really difficult to get it to cross through those hydrophobic outer membranes or cytoplasmic membranes. The idea here is that calcium, uh, uh, the calcium cations bind to the negatively charged DNA and make that combination electrically neutral. So it's going to be much easier to get the DNA to cross the outer membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, the like That I can get, but the transient pore stabilization, I'm like, wow, that's a stretch. But who cares, OK? So um, so if we were to cartoon this, and, and this is going to be just really for you guys, if we cartoon this and say this is our original E. coli, and I'll just put red for the outer membrane of the cell wall and white for the cytoplasmic membrane. And if we cartoon some, some DNA, okay, here's our DNA. The DNA can't, can't enter the cell, right? But after treatment with the calcium chloride in the cold temperature, and again, you guys, this is a stretch, but we'll just go with it. We'll show our artificially competent E. coli is having these stabilized pores and the cytoplasmic membrane, stabilized pore in the outer membrane. And believe me, you guys, I, I think it has to be more complicated than this, but okay. And then with the calcium chloride on board, um, we have an E. coli that is now competent. Okay, so we say a competent E. coli. Now the question is, how are we going to drive that DNA into our competent E. coli? And what they do is a real simple technique called heat shock. Okay. And heat shock, you simply rapidly increase the temperature. And in our lab experiment, we increase the temp from room temperature to about 42 degrees Celsius. And you guys remember, temperature is just the average kinetic energy of molecules. Um, it's the average speed of molecules. So by doing a, a quick heat shock, what you do is you, you speed up your competent E. coli, you speed up the DNA molecules, so you increase the chance of them colliding. And the whole thought is, is that you'll get a collision where one of the DNA fragments will just be, you know, just collided just the right place so that it can enter into the cytoplasm of the E. coli. Okay, and then if we use, okay, so then if we use yellow, for the E. coli chromosome. Again, what we're asking for here is that we have homologous recombination between the, the DNA and the E. coli chromosome. So after heat shock, we let the poor little traumatized E. coli recover. Okay, so our membrane, cytoplasmic membrane, now we're back to the normal state. But what we're hoping for is that we've had 
DNA-derived uh, homologous recombination where some of that donor DNA has been um, integrated into our little decoy chromosomes. And such a cell is described as a transformant. It's been changed. And the thought is that hopefully the E. coli RNA polymerase can transcribe the donor DNA and that the, and that the um, E. coli ribosomes will attach to the messenger RNA and translate that donor genetic information into new proteins. Okay. So this is like one of the most basic genetic engineering experiments. And like, like we said, we'll be we're doing it as a demo in lab. It's pretty, pretty easy, kind of scary how easy it is. So again, it makes us understand how in nature, transformation when we have these naturally competent bacteria, um, this is a significant way for bacteria to share antibiotic resistance genes, for example, to share capsule genes, to share toxin genes. And in um, the textbook, I think they say that this horizontal gene transfer, you know, maybe less than 1% of bacteria carry it out. But you guys, this is crazy for them to say less than 1% of bacteria perform it. If you think about it, in one mil of broth, after you grow a bacterial culture or one colony, the estimates is that represents 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 cells bacteria, right? And in one mil of broth, you, get, you can get the same concentrations, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 um, cells, you know, or bacteria. So um, these, these claims that only 1% of bacteria perform horizontal gene transfer, but you're talking about you know, Google lots of bacteria. That's still a lot of bacteria. That's a lot of bacteria. You're like one gram of poo, you know, you got more than 10 to the ninth bacteria. And one percent of them are undergoing horizontal gene transfer. That's a lot of promiscuity going on down there. Right. Anyway, okay. So I like when they say only one percent of bacteria, it's like that's a lot of bacteria because there's so many bacteria in the world. Okay, so we're gonna move on, you guys, to the next. Um, method of horizontal gene transfer called conjugation. And conjugation to us humans is the closest thing that looks like sex. You know, we're always trying to hang things on, you know, phenomena we're, we're comfortable with. So bacterial conjugation is sometimes named bacterial sex, but we want to realize it's not. Um, true sex is when you have two genetically distinct parents that produce gametes, and then you have union of the gametes to create a genetically distinct offspring. So even though this looks like it, and I know it looks like it, it's not a good sex. Okay. So as always, you guys, most of the work in bacterial conjugation was done in, who do you think? E. coli. E. coli, yeah. It's like E. coli, our little genetic workhorse. So we're, we're going we're to um, explore conjugation using E. coli as our model organism. And it turns out conjugation is the only example of horizontal gene transfer where the donor is actually alive. All the other ones, the donor is dead. Okay, so this is the only one where the donor is actually alive. So again, we're going to use our little E. coli as our example. And you guys remember, we always talk about donors and recipients. So for conjugation, they often use the abbreviation for a mating that we do in like animal breeding. So we just have to be careful. This is often when we're going to be talking about mating experiments between a specific donor and a specific recipient. So it turns out in E. coli, for E. coli to be able to carry out conjugation, it has to have special genes. It has to have special DNA sequences. And the special DNA sequence that permits conjugation in E. coli is called the fertility factor, or F factor. Now it turns out the F factor is what's um, known as an episome. And an episome is a, is a DNA um, sequence that can either exist independently outside of a chromosome or it can integrate into a chromosome. Okay? So the F factor, it can either um, um, circularize and turn into a plasmid, a self-replicating plasmid, in which case it's 
called the F plasmid. Um, e. coli that carry an F plasmid are called F plus. And here's the bad news, you guys. Um, they're often they're called F plus donors. But again, as humans, you know how we're always trying to relate things to what we're aware of. Unfortunately, we sometimes call them male. Males. And remember, it's misleading because there's no true males and females in bacteria, but we just we do it because it's, it helps us remember because we're more familiar with that. Okay. <laughs> but as an epizome, the F factor can also insert itself into the bacterial chromosome. Okay, so it can insert into the bacterial chromosome, in which case, the E. coli that carries the F factor chromosome, an E. coli that carries the F factor in the chromosome is called an HFR cell. And HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. And we're going to go and explore what these two um, donors, bacteria, what they can do. Okay, so HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. Okay, now we want to come back here and ask ourselves, so what, what are the special genes that we find in that factor? Okay, so the special genes encode information for the sex pillus, and the sex pillus is also called the conjugation pillus, or the F pillus. And if there was a short answer section, you guys, on the um, lecture exam three, and I was asking about conjugation, you can use either of these three names, so it's fine, fine by me. Okay, so um, you guys remember that, that um, uh, bacterial pillus is this hollow protein tube that extends from the surface of the bacterium. So the genes encode information for the pillin protein, the subunits that make up the, the pillus itself. And then in addition, there are genes for, uh, they're called tra genes, for transfer genes. And these are genes for proteins that um, encode what's, what's, this is a pretty recent discovery. It's called the type 3 secretory system. And the descriptions to me of these type 3 secretory system, it sounds like a protein a hypodermic syringe and needle. So this type 3 secretory system, we can think of it as a protein hypodermic syringe and needle that permits the donor bacterium to literally inject a recipient with copies of its DNA, hypodermic syringe and needle. And this um, type 3 sectory system, it probably is part of the base of the sex pillus itself, and we'll try to explain that as we go. Okay. Now, we said we're going to be talking about donors. Okay, so in conjugation in E. coli, the donor always has this F factor, okay, either in plasmid form or integrated into the chromosome. And then the recipient, so I'll put F factor positive, the recipient always lacks the F factor. So she, she and again, we call them the recipients, and of course, we call them females. Okay. Um, so the, the recipient, the female, lacks the F factor. Okay, so we can set the stage there. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at two different meetings. And the first meeting we'll look at using the PowerPoint slides. So here are our meetings. And meeting number one, we have our donor. We have our recipient. Meeting number one is going to be, be between an F plus um, donor, male. He has the F plasmid. And we're going to mate him with an F negative female recipient. Now, oh my gosh, this is such an incredible process, you guys. Just nature is unbelievable. Okay, so here's an electron micrograph of two conjugating E. coli. And here we have our F plus donor, our so called male. He has the F plasmid that carries the genes that encode the information for the sex pillows or conjugation pillows or F pillows right here. And over here is the recipient, um, the F negative female. Now, these guys are releasing chemicals that permit them to detect the presence of the other one in the environment. So these chemicals are called pheromones. 
And this is just wrong. You guys that have had AMP, you know pheromones are really important in humans. It lets us detect possibly genetically great partners. And, you know, so pheromones are involved in true sex in humans as well, as in so-called bacterial sex. So the exchange of these pheromones permits the donor to detect recipients in the neighborhood. That triggers synthesis of the sex pillus. And the sex pillus is made of these little protein subunits called pillin. So you can add more pillin to make the sex pillus longer, and you can disassemble this, uh, the, um, the pillin uh, subunits to shorten it. So the male assembles his sex pillus, and the purpose is, is to physically make contact with the recipient to attach to her surface. And then what the male can do, he can disassemble his sex pillus to draw her closer and closer and closer to him. And the way it was initially described to me, he, the, the object here is to get the female close enough so that type three secretory system can literally inject the recipient with a copy of DNA from the donor to the recipient. Although in one of the textbooks I just read, it's been documented that a male can transfer DNA to a female over a distance of 10 micrometers. And Gary Larson would have a great time with that particular because you figure the bacteria themselves are maybe like around one to two or three micrometers. And like you're talking about, they can exchange DNA over three times their body, body length. I mean, wow, that's impressive, I think. Okay. <laughs> so this is a cartoon of this first mating we were talking about. So here's our F plus, our F plus donor. And um, in your textbook, this is the year 8.27. They're just using the generic term for the F factor here, but I go ahead and call this an F plasmid since it's in the plasmid form. So here we have the donor that's made contact with an F negative um, recipient, and here we see this, um, um, it's called conjugation bridge or conjugation junction. And think of this as that type 3 secretory system, that hypodermic syringe and needle. And what the male will do is he's going to um, send a copy of his F plasmid through the conjugation bridge, through that type 3 secretory system into the female. And here we see um, the mating that's been completed. The male still remains female, still has a copy of the F plasmid. But now the female, since she has a copy of the F plasmid, she is no longer a recipient. She's no longer female. She is now what? Yeah. She's now a male donor, right? <laughs> And you guys know about these biology parties that we have and how, you know, kind of socially, you know, as biologists, we're not the, the wildest things. So, you know, typical conversation at a biology party, we talk about how sex is contagious amongst bacteria. You know, this is a hot topic in our hot biology meetings. You know, this conjugation of sex is contagious. Wow. We get just all worked up about that. Okay. Now, one might say, well, what? What the heck? You know, why does why does that process matter? I mean, what significance does it have? You know, it's like, okay, sex is contagious, you know, you nerdy biologists, so there's something to talk about. But you know, what's the significance in the real world? Well, I would argue the next mating is what makes um, this conjugation so important and what and what makes the F factor so important. So we're gonna look at another mating, and this mating is gonna be between an HFR donor, and remember HFR is when the F factor integrates and inserts itself into the donor's chromosome, and we're going to mate this HFR donor with an F negative female, and we're going to see, hopefully see why this conjugation is so significant. So first of all, here we see the formation of the HFR cell. We start with an F plasmid.